Ladies and gentlemen, your long national nightmare is over. The 2024 K-State basketball season has come to an ugly and predictable win in Iowa City. Uh, look, this team, they said, we missed the NCAA tournament. It would be wrong of us to not go out and give the performance that caused us to miss the NCAA tournament as they go out and turn the ball over a bunch. They look lost. Some guys look like they don't want to be out there. Tyler Perry just has an off night shooting the basketball. A lot of issues with what took place for K-State in their NIT game uh, against Iowa, and their season does come to an end. So uh, welcome into K-State Online, Mason Voth, Drew Galloway. I'm going to try and uh, not wake my daughter up or my wife will <laughs> kick my ass. So uh, if you're like, man, Mason's talking softer than usual or something's going on, that would be why. I uh, the, Where I record from is right below her room. So this is a just a, oh. a bold strategy. And if she wakes up, I have to deal with her and my wife screaming uh, for different reasons. So <laughs> we'll see how this uh, plays out. But Drew, uh, K-State falls 91-82, the final score. They, you know, similar to the loss to Iowa State, they got it close at times in the second half here. But once they got it close, they'd melt down, they'd do something silly and let Iowa push it back up. And it seemed like a lot of the struggles in this game it stemmed from guys that all season we've said you have to rely on these guys to be good and come through for you to have a chance. And Arthur Kaluma did nothing for you tonight after making the, that first three of the game. Kim Carter picked it up a little bit later late. I I think he was hustling tonight. I just think he's not a very smart player and, and good when he's asked to do more than what he should. And then Tyler Perry, the shots weren't falling. So uh, before we get into – the good and the positive and the looking ahead stuff that came from tonight's game. Uh, why did K-State lose and what's your takeaway from it? I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's it's like I've seen this movie before a million other times this season where K-State looked pretty good at times, looked pretty bad at times, had some really ugly turnovers. I made the joke uh, talking to some of my friends that I think the only turnover that K-State hadn't had was stepping over the the out-of-bounds line or the the baseline trying to throw the ball in, and we got that today. So it's a bingo for anybody that's been keeping track all season. Um, but it was just a microcosm of the season. Uh, another thing that I'll just throw out is a reason that they lost, at least this game, the defensive effort at times was pretty gross. Like it was leaving shooters wide open. Yeah, and shooters. I would also, I would also go in to say, uh, in terms of leaving shooters wide open, uh, this, this goes back to my point. Anybody that's uh, listened to me for a while knows that I'm a big proponent of playing offense in basketball. Uh, we saw tonight that uh, uh, the best defense is a good offense, and that's what Iowa did, and that's. That's what's made this K-State team so frustrating to me all season long is the fact that when you look at it, they just they, they've never had the offensive horses to be a legitimate threat and be a really good team this year. They had when they were lucky, maybe two or three guys that could play a good offensive game for you. And tonight you ran into a team that has it all over the place. And K-State, while good defensively at times, they don't force a lot of turnovers. And they have some guys that just they lose their heads far too often in the game in terms of knowing where they need to be and how they need to defend. And that's what we saw this evening with guys out of place. Yeah, it was just a whole like collapse pretty much defensively in the first half where I wrote that, like nothing that they tried or didn't try was going to work because for half the time. They just had Sand Sanford was wide open, or they just kept fouling. I mean, it, it's hard to stay in a game when you get out free throw the way that K State did tonight. And, and I also feel bad, kind of spiking the football here a little bit when it didn't go in K State's favor. But I, I did say that this was going to be the exact thing that happened, where it was going to be an offensive showcase. And I thought that K State just didn't have the horses, and yep. K State did not have the horses tonight. Yeah, no no doubt about that. Uh, so the season comes to an end for K-State. They they get to finish things off, and uh, they will go home, and now we'll see kind of what comes next for the Wildcats, who, uh, uh, you know, obviously going to be moments from this season that were really good, but 
they were a four and one team in Big Twelve play at one point, and they finished eight and ten, and they had a big losing streak tossed in there. It was it was just never a fun team to watch this season. Even the wins were not fun for this team, and the season finishes at nineteen and fifteen. And now uh, there will be questions moving forward about a lot of different things that Jerome Tang and his staff have to address in the off season. We know that. Tyler Perry and Will McNair will not be back. They can't come back. They don't have the option to. Arthur Kaluma has a year. He likely will not be back. Cam Carter is was only a junior, so he can come back, but we'll see You know what the path ends up being for him. One guy that will be back next season is Day-Day Ames, and he was probably the lone bright spot in this game for K-State tonight. 16 points, was efficient on the offensive side of the ball, if I have five five assists, but also the big thing is four or five from three. And we really saw his three point shooting have an uptick probably since that road game at BYU. And that's a really encouraging thing for him because for a while there, you started to think, okay, he can do some things. There's going to be a good player in there, but he just may be one of those guys that can never shoot. Maybe it's an apparition, but he did it enough consistently down the stretch that I'm excited to see Day Day Ames game develop even more going into next season. And that I mean, that's that's probably the biggest and best takeaway from this season for K State is how Day Day Ames developed. Yeah, before you could say with Day Day Ames, like I think it was around middle of January where he was pretty inefficient still and to the to the level of like Javon Thomas, if you want to get like into yeah. the numbers there, and then it's one of those where like you just had to squint, and you're like, okay, I think that he can become a good player still because he was still making good plays. He just wasn't finishing around the basket or shooting well. Now it's like, holy crap! Like, what's the level of leap that Day Day Ams can make in the next year? And the the thing that makes you encouraged is that. Even though he was a maddening player, I had a lot of times this year, that we did see Cam Carter take a pretty significant jump after a year. So you're hoping that Day Day can really take a big jump and become a more efficient player than Cam Carter was this season. And we've seen it already that the, that this staff has a track record of guards getting better. So you're, you're hoping that he takes a leap. The thing that impressed me the most wasn't even the shooting. I thought that passing tonight from day day was incredible and was something that had been kind of missing in K-State's offense all season long. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, day day aims is my math is correct. Uh, with tonight's performance going four or five behind the three point line, will finish the season as a, just below a 33% three point shooter, uh, which is pretty good considering where things were after the non-con, uh, in conference play, he was 38% from three. So if you want to go that UCF game on, he was even better than that. Um, now that's low volume. That would only be 34 shots that he took uh, from the UCF game on, but encouraging nonetheless. And that's a real positive. Another guy that has the option to come back, he went through the senior day stuff, but he could come back next year. And I think that K-State would like it is David Gasson. He had a pretty strong night, 12 and seven. We know that for a while now he's been banged up and playing through a pretty significant injury, but he came out, gave it his all again tonight, and he he played better down the stretch of the season, more consistent when he had the rest. I think we saw in the game against Iowa State that it, it was just too him. much for him to go back-to-back -back nights given the condition he's in right now. But that's another guy on this roster. When you talk about who do you want back next year, David Gasson should be on that list because not only – is he a serviceable piece for you? And do I think that he can get better? But also, he's a guy that when he comes back, he's not going to expect a different role. He is going to come in, give you the work that you need and want out of him, and he's going he's not going to take anything off for you. And I think that's what you need next year is to make sure that you have a, a team full of guys that not only do they have it up here in their head, but they also have it in here. And I think that we saw – one of the things that was the biggest killer of this K-State team this year was that they couldn't balance that out where they had some guys that didn't have it up here. They didn't have some guys that had it in here. And then you had some guys that just, they didn't have either. And next year you need more guys. Like I, I think if you had more dudes that played the way that David Gasson and Tyler Perry did tonight, and I know that Tyler Perry did not have a good shooting game, 
but he was still playing hard. He's wanted it. Like if you had guys that played and cared like those two did, like a full roster of them, K State would not have been in the NIT this year. But I think they had some guys that had some lackadaisical performances and just didn't really give a damn about how things were going to finish up for them. Yeah, the if we were making a list of who I would want back next season, I honestly think even with how much I talked about how Day-Day has a super high ceiling, I think David Gasson would be my number one choice because of what you pointed out. He is a program guy. You need guys like him in your program to be stable. I think in this day of college basketball, especially having somebody that is around for three years in the program, kind of knows the ins and outs, has been to an elite eight, has had a bad year uh, as a team. Like you think that you would think that his hunger would just be like ready to roll uh, starting next season because he's just been through it. And you hope that next year, like Cam Carter becomes a little bit more vocal if he comes back. So th those are, that's my biggest reason for having David Kassam back. I, I would also encourage him to just spend a lot of time at the free throw line over the summer. Because True. if he's going to be out there at the end of games next year, yeah, I think that we've had two years of it now that teams are just going to start fouling him in a close game. Yeah, he needs to. He's at the point now where the rest of the game is there. He kind of needs to get into the into like. Uh, I think the best the best comp that I would give for this, like he needs to get into the to the DJ Johnson positioning with how yeah. you think about how DJ became a shooter, like at the end of everything. And what I would like point out with that is, you know, maybe not necessarily. Well, the free throws are in there, too. But like DJ, the first two years at K-State that he played, he was a 55 and 51 percent free throw shooter. And then he jumped up to 67 percent his junior year. Uh, he had that year out with an injury. But then his last year, the the first four team, he was 70% at the line. And honestly, with that team, you almost felt like he was your best option to go to the line. And not only had he gotten to a point where he had the rhythm and like the, the muscle memory at the free throw line, he had also added that spot at like the block extended. I think that's where David Gasson needs to work. It's you're not trying to become a better shooter because you're just not going to be able to do that. But if you can go out and do it enough, like what you're saying, and get the muscle memory down where you can trick yourself into becoming a serviceable free throw shooter where David Gasson, one of K-State's most energetic players on the floor, can be out there at the end of games instead of having to put somebody else out on the floor. So I, I think that's a good point about Gasson. And the other thing that we saw, and we've kind of already talked about it, but K-State has to go out and find guys that can score the basketball from beyond the perimeter in the offseason. Yes. And you have that has to be a priority because the teams that Jerome Tang had that were talented and good at Baylor, they had shooters. And we saw this year, K-State just didn't have enough of them. Yeah. Uh, so again, adding with Gasson, if he even gets to like 63% from yeah. where he is right now, that would make a huge difference. But K-State needs a lot of shooters on the perimeter, especially if Arthur Coloma doesn't come back. You're already not getting Tyler Perry back. You need guys that can fill it up. Because, like you said, Baylor's best team was the national championship team that had three elite shooters on it. So if K-State can find two elite shooters and have Day-Day develop into more of a, a shooter by volume to add with his percentage, it, this could be a fun offense. And just having shooters just opens up things so much because that, because that's also like adds to data against his best skill set which is getting to the rim it's a lot easier to get to the rim when you got when you have guys close out hard on you yeah no that's that's a good point so we'll, we'll see where uh that kind of goes all right probably the biggest off-season elephant in the room and we'll we'll talk much deeper about this k-state season and what comes next uh on sunday when when we reunite for the uh the final in-season sunday show of the year with case you underscore fan because i'm sure he'll have thoughts on everything um actually i guess shoot we don't even have to record it or at our normal time on sunday because uh, we won't have a game to worry about um cam carter what is the solution in the next move with him where do you stand on that because how you feel may be different from what has to happen or what does happen uh but do you want him back or or how should the cam carter situation be handled moving forward I want Cam Carter back because kind of like for the same reason of Dave, of David Gasson, we're in the era of lots of like one one year guys coming into the program, coming out. 
you need somebody that has been there before. But I, I think that we're at a point now where we've seen where he probably needs to be on a team where he's the third or fourth option on the offensive end because of how streaky he is and how how he is dribbling the ball because he's he's not the best ball handler because he still gets a little sped up. So the game is a lot easier when you're like the third or fourth option. And I think that he is probably a player that would be best as the third or fourth option. And there's nothing wrong with that because everybody needs that kind of player Mm -hmm. on the team. So it'd be him more just accepting that role, I think, than anything else. Yeah, I mean, look, there's the best point and example recently for that. And the benefit for Cam Carter is, is that, it's not going to be you're in this role, in this role, and then your last season, it's totally different for you. But I would, you know, different issues, different type of player. But to me, like Xavier Sneed is a prime example of he was a really good player for K-State and important to a team that won a Big 12 title and went to an Elite Eight when he was maybe the fourth best player on yeah. that team. And we saw his senior year, like K-State was crappy in 2020 when he had to be expected to be the best player on that team. Cartier Jada, similar boat on that team where when he had to play more and have a bigger role, his flaws were put on show. Last year, Cam Carter, there were, there were problems there with his game, but like they, you didn't ask as much of him. He didn't have the ball as much. They weren't as notable. And that's one of the things to point out about this year is Cam Carter, who seemed like he turned it over a lot, the rate at which he turned the ball over this season was less than what he did last year. But he had thousands more touches this year than he did last season, and the expectation was that he needed to be K-State's best or second-best player this season. So I would say this. Cam, I would like Cam Carter back next season, but you have to guarantee that you're going to have a handful of players that are significantly better than him and going to be the true alphas of this team for K-State because you can't have the same situation you had this year where you have a top three of Perry, Kaluma, and Carter, and all of those guys are like 1B players at their peak. And so you have to get better there in some regard. If you can't guarantee that you're going to upgrade the roster significantly in those top spots, I don't really know that there's a purpose for having Cam Carter back because – It's just going to frustrate, I think, everybody involved in the situation. And Cam Carter has to get better over this offseason. Like, these are things that he can work on. You can watch more basketball. You can become a smarter basketball player. He needs to do that. He needs to work on his ball handling and not just, like, dribble, 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 but, like, oh, this is a pass I do make. This is a pass I don't make. This is how I grab the ball. Because these are all, it seems very simple, all problems that he has. So, I'm not totally out on Cam Carter, but there needs to be a drastic reduction in what he does for this team. He also needs to become a more consistent three-point shooter. But again, this is going to be his fourth year of college basketball coming up next year. I just don't know that that's in the cards for a guy that's been, you know, like around 31, 32% for his career. Uh, I'll also add to that if Cam Carter is case, it's probably fourth best player next year that the team is probably going to be pretty damn good. Mm-hmm. So that that's what you would like to see. And I mean, it, it's definitely possible. We're, we're on track right now to have, I think, potentially a better transfer portal just in terms of talent that's in the transfer portal already than we did last season. So there, there's there's some encouragement. Yeah. All right. Final thing. And we'll, we'll talk deeper about this when it comes to Sunday and uh, give more reflective because the rest of the week uh, you all can just rest easy knowing that we're going to talk about K-State football, something that seems to be chugging in a very positive direction right now. Uh, I I told people this, and everybody kind of knows my stance or should. In season, I was sick of hearing about the Naquan Tomlin crap. I It was the most worthless excuse for why they lost the game at Texas Tech and why they lost the game you know, at BYU and why they lost this game here at Oklahoma State and what – at some point, like Naquan Tomlin was never on this team this season when games were being played. So they have to go out and find ways to win with the team that they currently have, and they didn't. That's the expectation. That's what's needed of them. But I did always say that at the end of the season, in big picture, 
it should be considered and addressed and talked about that this team was without Naquan Tomlin, who easily would have been at least their second best player this year, uh, possibly their best. And you also were without Quez Glover, a significant rotation piece that you expected to have that could also help you handle the ball that could have been on the floor more when Tyler Perry or Cam Carter were struggling, or you didn't have to rely on unready 18 year olds earlier in the season than you would have wanted. So that all played a significant role in why K State went 19 and 15. So I think when people talk about this season, it's important to not greatly melt down and overreact to the coaching job that Jerome Tang did and the way that this roster was built. Because at the end of the day, we never once got to see the actual roster that Jerome Tang constructed. Now, he did bring these players in to his program. So does Naquan Tomlin, you know, some of that responsibility fall on Jerome Tang for having a guy on the roster that, look, you can debate the merit of was it right or wrong that he was kicked off the team, but he had a guy that did enough things that built up to where somebody felt like he didn't belong on this team anymore. And you did bring in a guy that had injury history like Quez Glover. Those are fine things to say, but at the end of the day, K-State never once had the roster that they anticipated having when you know they started workouts in September. So that is something to consider in the grand scheme of things. We've seen just two seasons of the Jerome Tang experience. One year was one of the best K-State basketball seasons that we've seen in my lifetime. One Probably, if you're talking about fun, probably the most fun K-State basketball season yeah. we've had in my lifetime. Maybe you know 08 with Beasley could rival, rival it, but that's more so just like the overall vibe inside of it like there were some maddening games and they were an 11 seat now they were under seated i would say but still like that's a that is a very high bar season this year if this is going to be what lights your brain on fire about jerome tang 19 and 15 and still playing some form of postseason basketball and beating kansas and beating baylor and beating iowa state at home and having these games that that are fun and, and going to be all, all right to remember that to me is not a problem. Now you just have to make sure that this does not happen every single year or every other year. And I mentioned it over the weekend, but you, you look around and you think like Bruce Weber was here 10 years. He made five NCAA tournaments, five years. He didn't do anything once the season ended. And as much as it sucks and as much as, it, as it's a, you know, participation trophy type tournament playing in the NIT to me is better than just ending the season doing nothing because it at least means that you did play of a level at times where you look like a good team. And I will always say this, like even as maddening and as not fun as they were to watch at times, I would rather have K-State basketball in my life than not. And so we don't have it in our lives until next November, which is unfortunate, but we're getting ready to start that time of the year that gets people really excited and probably more entertaining the actual season itself because it's going to be that new feeling of all these different guys coming in uh, and who's going to make this team better hopefully next season. So that's, uh, that's I guess, my final quick takeaway on the K-State basketball season. Yeah, it's just – it's hard for a team to have sustained success when you have two of your top six never play a game for you. I mean, we, small sample size because we only saw for one game – and it's probably KU's two best players, but KU didn't have two of their two of their top six against Cincinnati in the Big Twelve tournament and got their ass kicked. True. So, so I mean, it, it it's hard to be winning constantly when you're just down those two players because that means that you're probably out talented going in every game. And if this is Jerome Tang's worst season, and K State still won four games against the top the top 25 in the net. I mean, that that's still a pretty decent season. No season, nobody wants to end it in the NIT. I don't want to end it in the NIT. But I, I think that with the circumstances around the season, it it's not the worst thing that could have happened because if I told you, if I told you in November that Quest Glover and Naquan Tomlin were never going to play a single minute for KZ this season, what would you say that the record was? Uh, I mean, there were, there was a time going into the season when even before we knew that Glover wasn't going to play that I was like, this team is, is like 500 at best the way that things were feeling and looking like. So uh, the fact that they finished 19 and 15 and even gave themselves a very remote possibility 
uh, of being in the NCAA tournament, I think is is impressive enough. I, I think I think Jerome Tang actually did a, a good job coaching this team this year. And I know some people don't want to hear that and they're going to be upset about that. Uh, but given what I saw, I think a lot of the problems that this team had were things that a coach can't fix uh, as drastically as he needed to. Now, look, you can say, hey, he brought these guys in. That's very true. Um, but at the end of the day, like, it's just that is what it is in building a team this year. And the one thing that you have to remember in terms of how it's being built is look at how Baylor got to where they were, where, yes, they they hit on the guys in the portal that they wanted even before you know it was like the true transfer portal silliness. But they got their program to a point where the recruiting was able to sustain itself and they were able to build most of their depth and a true program with what they did with their high school recruiting. And we just saw what the first foundation of that looks like for K-State basketball with Day-Day Ames ending his season on a really high note. Things to like about R.J. Jones. Uh, we'll see how the Michaela Rich thing plays out, but like he gave a good first half for K-State tonight, and you could develop him down the road. There's certainly athleticism there. And you're bringing in David Castillo, who to me has more immediate on-the-floor upside than any of the three freshmen from this season because he's a legit shooter coming into this thing. Uh, let me refer. He's a legit maker coming into this thing because RJ Jones is a shooter. Uh, he needs to become a maker, but that is a benefit and that's going to continue to happen. And when you do that, you have less pieces that you have to add and you don't have this large overhaul like Jerome Tang had to do after a team that went to the elite eight last season. So that is another thing to keep in, in mind, and I, that's I think Jerome Tang did um, as well of a job as he could have this year, given the circumstances and everything he had go on. Uh, he's just going to have to make sure that he gets it right in in twenty twenty five. Yeah, your your best teams are the ones that have high school guys added with transfers, and I hate saying this because I really don't like them, but how Iowa State's roster construction is like, that's probably the perfect roster construction of you have a lot of high school talented guys and you've found the right transfers. So if, yeah. if, if they can find the right transfers going into the next season, I mean, you have to like where K-State's at because you have all this talent that's already in the under in the underclassmen so far. Yeah, no, that is a, uh, a very good point and probably, a good way to end it. I guess I would would say uh, if you if you want it to be like Iowa State, a challenge probably needs to be given out to uh, Manhattan High. And uh, when are you going to start producing uh, players like Tame and Lipsy and you know, some, of these other guys, some of these other guys that are from Ames or just directly around Ames, <laughs> and uh, and can give maybe a little bit of a boost there. Uh, it also, you know, in-state recruiting becomes tough when Kansas has very few guys ever that are worth it. And then you, you factor in that the Iowa-Iowa State dynamic, those are two pretty similar programs. Iowa State's actually the, you know, probably in my eyes would be the more uh, highly thought of one. Um, K-State's got a little bit more of an uphill battle with their uh, in-state uh, a foe. But, you know, we'll we'll see how it all goes this offseason and what uh, – is next in store for Jerome Tang and K-State. And if you want to keep up with everything that's about to go on with K-State's offseason, because I would guess that within the next 24 to 36 hours, we see names in the portal from K-State and guys that K-State's trying to line up you know, to, to get serious consideration from. Uh, so head over to kstateonline.com, find on three. We're right there under the K-State tab. And uh, if you're not a member, you should be because you get great football and basketball content as well as all the recruiting info that you need. K-State football hosting uh, recruits all throughout the week and month, trying to get some uh, 2025 guys in and ready to go. Um, so plenty of things to consider right now with K-State basketball and football, even though we won't have another K-State game uh, in one of the revenue sports until – the last week of August when football kicks off. So a lot to get to still this off season and Jerome Tang and his staff will certainly have to be busy as they try to clean up the really overall mess of a season that 2024 was. And at the end of the day, uh, if the mess is 19 and 15 and still playing postseason basketball, and like Drew said, having some good wins, that's, that's as good of a mess as you can hope for. Uh, it's like growing up, uh, 
me and my brother, we could have messy rooms, but at the end of the day, if you ask my mom, she would have rather have had Matt's messy room over my messy room because mine was going to be a lot messier than his was. So Jerome Tang, I, I think that he, uh, he had my brother's messy room instead of mine because you can look around and find other coaches throughout the country that their bad seasons look a lot worse than what K-State had this year. And that's one thing to consider. And I think one thing, again, I'll say it one more time because I, I don't think Jerome Tang deserves as much vitriol as he might get from some, but I think it showcases the job that Jerome Tang did. And sometimes with coaches, you can you can find more out about them, about how things look in their worst seasons than their best. Uh, and certainly things to not like about this year with you know Jerome Tang himself and how he handled things. But overall, I thought he did a nice job. And uh, you just hope that K-State has better horses to get it done next year. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. That'll do it for us. We'll be back uh, on Sunday with KSU underscore fan to discuss K-State basketball a bit more and any breaking news that comes about with the K-State basketball program. Uh, we'll also have plenty of football stuff for you throughout the week. So keep locked into K-State Online here on the YouTube. Subscribe if you want to, and then head over to kstateonline.com with On3. We're out of here. Cats fall again. 91-82, their season comes to an end in Iowa City.